We're going to be continuing our Old Testament study this evening, and we're going to be looking at a uh, really a failure of faith, a lack of belief, and we're going to dissect that, and we're going to be reading primarily through Numbers 13 through 14. Uh, we'll read the majority of these two chapters. There will be some commentary in between sections, but a lot of it just will be reading, and we'll draw some, some applications from it as well. As you can see from my terrible handwriting, if you can read it, just a just a general outline of these two chapters here. Um, we're going to be looking at, well, first off, let's go with some background. I'm sorry. Um, so this has been two years now that is, the Israelites has le have left Egypt since the Exodus. Um, it's only been probably a few months since receiving the law from Mount Sinai. They were there nearly a year there at Mount Sinai re receiving the law. And, uh, in this time, Israel, they've received the law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, they've built the tabernacle. They've established that. And they've also set in order the priesthood. We've looked at all those things up to this point. And uh, some time has still passed. And they've tested God a few times already. Nine times, we'll see. This will be the tenth that they have tested God and that they have complained against Him, that they have murmured, that they have... Um, brought accusations against his leadership of Moses and Aaron. And this will be a tenth and very, um, very devastating test for, for Israel. And uh, now they're nearing the land that, he, that God has promised to give them. They're, in the land, they're nearing the land of Canaan. They're at Kadesh Barnea, is where they currently are. And they're soon about to take a look for the land for the first time. So what we'll see here through the chapters, we're going to look at first there is that um, Moses sends some spies out to to check out the land, and then the, this, we'll look at the spies' report, how the nation responds to the spies' report, and also how God responds to Israel's response. And then we're going to look at the consequences from, from all this and then draw a couple applications, as you can see here on my left. Uh, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and uh, read Numbers 13, verses 1 through 2. There the Bible says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So God told Moses to, to send a leader, not just any man, not just uh, a young teenager or anything else. He said to pick a leader from each, each tribe of Israel to go forth and to spy out this land. And that's important when we get down later into these verses. These were the the cream of the crop, so to speak. These should have been the boldest, the, the best, the, the best choice men to send on this mission. So let, we won't go through their names. Their names are listed in verses 3 through uh, verse uh, 16. We'll pick up there at uh, Numbers 13, verse 17. And we'll read through verse 24. So Moses commanded them to go out and see a couple things, what the land was like. Was it good or bad? Was it fertile? Was it... Was it dry? Was it was the land rich? Were the people? How were the people? Were they strong? Were they weak? Um, what about the cities? Is it, are they just dwelling in tents? Are these fortified cities? And he also told them to bring back some of the some of the fruit of the land. And and importantly, he told them to to take courage in doing this. So now let's read the spies' report. What they have to say about the land. That's there at. Uh, Pick up at verse 25 and read through 33. So the report actually started out pretty good. They did confirm it truly is uh, what, what we thought it was, what we were promised it was. It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. It was fertile. It was rich. It was a great place to be. All of the exception of the, the people that were there, and it scared them to death. Um, it, they said it was inhabited by giants. They said the, the cities were fortified. They had strong walls. And the people there were strong. And the fear, the fear of the people in the land was soon became greater than the desire that they had to go in to possess it. Very quickly. It was a big letdown, really. They, it was everything they thought it was and then some. And then they, they saw who lived there. And then their hearts sank. Caleb tried to stop the fear. He, uh, he, he's calmed the whole, and this is before the whole congregation of Israel. I don't, you know, everybody's there in this, in this report. And he, he, he quiets everybody down. He says, we can do this. Um, let's go at once and get it. It's basically what he said. Let's go. But everyone else 
the other 10, or yeah, 10 of the other 12 would not have it. They, they basically lied about the, the report then to the rest of the people. They said the land was a land that devoured its people and the people there were giants. And they did everything they could to persuade the, uh, the, the congregation that it was, it was not going to be possible. And they succeeded in doing just that. But when we look at Caleb, he trusted the promises of God. He realized that it wasn't in himself or in the people that they had the ability to, to take this land. They realized that God had given it to them. It was theirs for the taking. They just had to do it. But unfortunately, the other spies could only see it for... They only saw it as they were looking at their own capacity. They, they didn't think about God's promises. They didn't have any trust in that promise. They only, they only saw that for what it was and how they themselves could not overpower these people and they cowered down because of it but they had these same people have seen with their own eyes like i said this has only been two years since since the exodus this has only been two years since those 10 plagues against egypt and pharaoh they saw every one of these they were witness to everyone an eyewitness not just it was passed down to their great grandpa they were the people that lived through it they saw the passover the the death of all the firstborn of egypt they saw all these things. They, they crossed through the Red Sea themselves. And they were there at Mount Sinai with, with, with God. And each and every day, the cloud, the fire, the cloud above the tabernacle and the fire, by, fire at night was there with them. All of these things, and they got the manna from heaven, all of these miracles, and they still cowered down. They didn't trust God. All of the evidence that he was faithful, that he was just, that he was who he said he was, they didn't take. At the first look of the people, they'd had enough. And they let fear overtake them, and that became their motivator from that point. So much so that the ten uh, fearful spies lied about the land, as I already said, and convinced the whole congregation that it, was, it, was a, it would be a failed attempt to go there. So let's look at Israel's response as the, in general, the, the nation of Israel responds. Numbers 14, verses 1 through 4. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the congregation of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said one to another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. That's kind of a, probably a low of lows right here. Of all, as, all the things we just talked about, they want to go back. Just, just by seeing these people. They slander Moses and Aaron. They complain, wishing, literally wishing to have died in Egypt or to die in the wilderness rather than face the Canaanites. They even slander God in claiming that he brought them out of Egypt just to die and to kill, have their women and children killed before them. And that, that should, I'm sure, if God's anger is boiling, as we'll soon see. But in, from his perspective, you've got to be to the point of just losing it with these people. And he was. And at the end of all of the moaning and crying, they, they decide they really do, in fact, to want to return to Egypt. They've completely written off the promises of God. They have no faith, they have no courage, and they have no hope in what he has for them. Look, now we'll look at how Joshua and Caleb try to plead with the people. Numbers 14, verses 5 through 10. So Joshua and Caleb were the only two that uh, understood how they could take the land. They believed God, they trusted his promises. Um, and they knew that it was through his power that they could overcome this people and take possession of the land. Um, a lot of people quote this verse, and I think it's out of context a lot of times. But Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That has nothing to do with athletics. It has nothing to do with running the football. It has nothing to do with rags to riches, sob stories about how you came from nothing and you're so great. It has nothing to do with academics or anything else. The only thing it has to do with is your ability to accomplish the will of God. And uh, Joshua and Caleb exemplify this attitude in their situation. Very much so. They saw the same land. They saw the same cities. 
they saw the same giants, and they, but what they saw them from was not from their, they, they saw them from God's perspective, from what they were to God, and that was nothing. Just a small block in the road there, and they were ready to go over it. But everyone else saw it from their own perspective, from their own shoes. So Romans 8 and 31 says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that was, their, that was their mentality. They were ready. But unfortunately, the rest of the camp had never read Romans 8 and 31. And they just cowered down. They were even so far, so scared about this. They, they were beginning to, they were about to kill Joshua and Caleb. And then God's presence came into the camp. Basically stopped that. So let's continue on there. Let's look at God's response. Verses 11, Numbers 14, verses 11 through 12. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. That sounds great. That's what they deserve. Um, God's anger here is very just. You know, what he said there is the signs and the wonders. He's, how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? What more can I do to get these people to believe and trust me? And they won't. He's had it. And now Moses, I couldn't have done it. He intercedes for the, on behalf of the people. Here he has an offer from God to make him that great nation, destroy them and, and go on. But Moses, Moses pleads, bleeds on behalf of the people. Here we'll read that verses 13 through 19. There it says, And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. They have heard that you, the Lord, are among these people, that you, the Lord, are, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them. And you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the father on the, on the fathers, on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of the people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. I said, I don't know that I could have said that on their behalf. I don't know that I would have been any different than them. I'm not going to say that. I'm not saying I'm better than them or any of us would, where we would be in this situation. But if I was in Moses' shoes, I'd had trouble with that statement. But he was better than I, I'd say. And he appealed to God's character, verse 18. This is actually a reference back to Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. This is a self-proclaimed, this is a self-proclaimed description of God that he made. There it says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Moses reminds him of these things, and he stays his anger. He relents. Um, but this doesn't mean that there's not going to be punishment. So in his punishment, he, first off, I'd like to say he exemplifies in his punishment everything that he claimed he was in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. You see every attribute of that relayed in this punishment. He was merciful to them. He was very merciful and forgiving of many times. He was very gracious in that. But also, he was also visiting the iniquity of these men will be visited upon their children as well upon many generations to come because of this action. And we see that here. Numbers 14 and 2, we've already read through it, but, it's, but it says, All of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, 
If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Well, you got it. It's yours. Instead of entering Canaan, the faithless Israelites will die like the thoughtless cries they cried when they were too afraid to conquer the land. When they were talking out of their heads, they got what they asked for. Um, for 40 years, one year for each day that they went out to the land, they're going to be their children and all of them will be wandering through the, the wilderness with no home, with no direction. Everyone 20 years and old upward will, will die before, before Canaan ever comes back. And, uh, and all the spies themselves we saw were, were, uh, were stricken with a plague. Ten of the twelve were killed except uh, Joshua and Caleb. Now let's read Numbers 13. We'll finish out the chapter here, 39 through 45. Then Moses told these, things, told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went, went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Horma. The people still didn't get it. The Lord was not with them. They could not take that land. The Lord was with them and they wouldn't take the land. Kind of a ironic situation there but they didn't they, they still were thinking their power their ability their they can do it you know what they want and they could they couldn't do anything without God and they they I'd say they soon learned that but we'll, they don't soon learn that yet uh, there's there's some other things that still happen so I think we see all the consequences from this but there's really we're going to look now at a, a a couple more points, further consequences from this one mistake. Um, that's kind of one of the points here is sin can be forgiven, but sometimes the consequences are going are gonna to roll through your life and you're going to have to deal with them for the rest of your life. You can be forgiven, but you're still going to face the, the suffering and the pain and everything that the sin brings on. And if you just look through numbers... Um, I've got four instances here, and there's, there's probably quite a few more between this failure and when they come into Canaan. Look at all the other terrible things, the, the atrocities they commit before God and their punishments back and forth through this time that they could have eliminated if they just sort of had faith and, and did it right the first time. But now they're going to pay for it in more ways than one. You look at that Korah's rebellion, that's just two chapters over, they... The, the people, again, led by Korah, basically um, defy Moses and Aaron's authority and uh, basically try to create an uprising. And in that day, uh, over 14,000 people were killed by God. Then the, uh, the account of the bronze serpent in Numbers 21, the people once more complained against God and Moses, and he sent, uh, basically, it says fiery serpents among them, and when they were bitten, they would, be, they would die from that snake bite. Another failure there. Even Moses himself, think about that. Numbers 20 at Kadesh, he, he, didn't, he didn't follow God's uh, command in giving the, the ch children of Israel water, and in doing so, his punishment was that he he himself would not be able to enter the promised land because of that mistake. Not to say that he couldn't be forgiven, but once more, the consequences of your sins are separate from being forgiven. And then Numbers 25, Israel commits idolatry and some 24,000 people are killed in a plague. So we see how all these things just roll downhill. How one thing... Uh, stems stems into another failure here, and eventually they do they do learn and they do conquer the land. But this one setback cost a lot, a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble and a lot of pain for Israel. 
So a couple things, I think just a couple applications here. We're, we're nearly finished here, but the first one there is that faith in ourself is, leads to failure. Faith in God will lead to success. Um, uh, the people, you know, they were only looking at taking the land from their own physical capabilities, from their own capacity, and really quick they realized they didn't measure up to the giants. They didn't. From that point, fear set in. That became their motivator, and they they forgot what God promised them. They forgot who God was. They forgot what they'd lend, what they'd been through, and just cowered down. But Caleb and Joshua based their success off God's promises. They knew it wasn't their own ability that was going to get them that land, but they knew. He said, "These men are our bread. God is." Um, God has made them basically defenseless. They're ours for the taking. They knew that. They understood that. And they had the faith to do just that. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we can do nothing of value to God if we don't have faith in the right person, in God, not in ourselves. Don't trust in yourself. Trust in God. And then the other the other point here is that sin can be forgiven but the consequences aren't going to stop what you do you can commit a sin you can you can uh you can repent of it you can honestly repent truly repent you can pray to god for forgiveness and you will be forgiven you can make it right with whoever you wronged on this earth to they can forgive you and all can be well but you're still going to deal with the problems that you cause they're not going to go away the pain from that is still going to be there. The trust that you lost is going to take a long time to rebuild if you ever do rebuild it. So there's effects to sin, and I think we can see that as a very good example from this story. All of the things that, that rolled down from that mistake. Um, Galatians 6 and 7 says, Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he, will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will love the Spirit, reap everlasting life. You know, we can hurt ourselves and others in permanent physical ways because of our sins, our actions. We can lose relationships. We can lose trust. We can lose a uh, reputation that you know we may never recover. And that was one thing that really struck me um, reading through that. Numbers 14, verse 30, 33, in the middle of God sent, sentencing these people. There he says, And your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Your sin affects more than you. Once you become a parent, that's it's very serious. It's very serious anyway, but I think that's when I realize it. When I think about my kids and you know, what they may have to deal with because of me. It's things we've got to consider. You know, unfortunately, the ones that we're closest to will often be the ones who are most affected by our poor decisions. So that's just something that we have to, have to always be aware of when we're looking at things, when we're tempted. We've got to keep these things in our minds. The effect, not just the, the immediate effect, don't go don't ever go into to a temptation or you know if i do this i know i can get forgiveness don't 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 do that that's no way to approach anything just remember though first and foremost remember you're sinning against god and he's your judge but also remember what what could what could come from that too and that's what I think many times we, we, fail to, we fail to think about, we fail to do. So ultimately, that, that's the conclusion of my lesson. Two things there is just trust in God and stick with his program. If they would have done that, how smooth that would have went. And also, is, don't allow the, the fears of this world to interfere with your spiritual faith. They let um, some giants, they were giants, sure but they weren't god they let that that interfere with conquering canaan delayed israel's progress for 40 years and caused them a lot of heartache suffering and 
a lot of death that was premature because you think about that everyone 20 years to up in 40 years every 20 year old would be dead that's going to be short in lifespan on a lot of people because a lot of these people were living very long so it wasn't just you know finishing out your life old and gray you were you might have been well in your prime and you're dead so there's a lot of consequences to our sins but we just have have the faith that we're supposed to have like they didn't have we'll be okay